Okay, it's uh, two minutes past 10, so I guess we should get started. How's everybody this morning? Good? Thumbs up? Good. Very good. Um, so let's, this morning, I wanted to kind of continue our discussion of the various um, social justice traditions with a particular emphasis on the modern Catholic social teaching um, corpus of work on social justice. And as you can, as you will see, it's kind of very detailed, uh, but it builds on what we've been talking about for the past few weeks. It builds on Aristotle, it builds on Aquinas, it builds obviously on the, on the Jewish and Christian scriptures. Um, so you'll see that very clearly. Um, and then I think I'll, I'll spend a while talking about that. And then I will, uh, I think we can have a few minutes at the end to talk about your first assignment. Uh, we can answer any questions that you might have and uh, clarify a few things. Uh, does that make sense? We'll do that? Okay, very good. Um, yeah, so as I said, uh, we've, with both me and Professor Sachs, we've discussed a lot of different social justice traditions. Like Professor Sachs um, probably dazzled you on Tuesday by going through I think 10 different social justice traditions. Um, we've put a lot of readings in the uh, Blackboard this week. And one reason we did that is because of the assignment, just to help you out. There, there generally will not be that many readings per week, but I guess we did this for two reasons. One, we're talking about a lot of different social justice traditions. And we will, don't worry if you, if you, if you find it overwhelming, we will be coming back to some of them later. And I'll, I'll talk about that more at the end. And, um, and it's to help. And really, um, as I said, it's to help you um, with the assignment uh, to do some readings there. Not all, of, some of those readings are easier than others. I'll be honest about that. Some of them are difficult. I find people like Nozick are difficult to read. I, I, I readily admit that. Um, so that we we'll talk about that later. So let's talk about the, the tradition of Catholic social teaching. Let me, um, oops. I need to share my screen first. That's not going to work. <laughs> Hang on a second. Okay, so everybody can see the screen, right? Yes, okay, very good. So we're in, I wanted to talk about the, the Catholic social tradition, the modern Catholic social tradition is really the, the tradition of the papal encyclicals. These are documents written by popes um, from over the past 120 or 130 years. Um, and these are very important. I would encourage you to read some of these. They're all readily available on the Vatican website. You just Google the title and it'll pop up immediately. You can read it online. You can print it out uh, however you prefer to read things. Um, the older ones are harder to read because they're written in more kind of archaic language. The modern ones, especially by Pope Francis, are pretty easy to read, and they're definitely worth reading. Um, the, some of them are long, some of them are not so long, um, but we, we can, uh, I'll, 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 let, let's go through them so I can flag what each one says. Um, so the tradition started in 1891 with a document called Rerum Novarum, which is Latin for on new things by Pope Leo XIII. And what was this? Well, we have to go back to the context of the 19th century and the Industrial Revolution. Um, for a long time, the Catholic Church was in a very reactionary position, especially after the French Revolution, when priests and nuns were executed and the church was basically abolished. The church became very defensive and hunkered down and basically aligned with the forces of reaction. So if you see... Um, teachings from the mid 19th century, you will see strong criticisms of things we see today as basic civil rights, like democracy, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, were criticized as, 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 as liberalism. Um, but what happened is in 1891, we had a dramatic change 
because also at this time, as democracy was progressing um, throughout Europe in particular, so was the Industrial Revolution progressing. And with it, there were great uh, and numerous injustices between rich and poor, capital and labor, um, wealthy countries and developing countries, especially colonies. And Pope Leo XIII realized that workers were being treated abominably. If you, if you want to, again, I, I appeal to the work of Charles Dickens uh, for a, an analysis of or a social commentary on how workers were treated in the mid 19th century. They were treated as cogs of production. Their dignity was not respected. They were paid terrible wages, working 12 hours a day, six days a week. Children as young as 10 were working in coal mines. Um, it, it was what we would see today as pretty abominable working conditions and terrible mistreatment of, of human beings. So in, in 1891, Pope Leo, he basically applied the ancient teachings of the Christian tradition from Aristotle, well, pre-Christian tradition, from Aristotle through the, uh, the Gospels, Hebrew Scriptures, Church Fathers, um, Tom, especially Thomas Aquinas, to this new modern situation of the Industrial Revolution. And he basically argued very forcefully that workers had to be treated with dignity and respect. They had to be paid a living wage. They had to have the right to form unions and they had to have a right to live in a, in a dignified manner. A very strong teaching. Uh, some of the more reactionary and conservative critics thought that the church had no business interfering in matters of economics like that. It should be concerned with saving souls. Uh, criticism we still see today uh, as when like Pope Francis speaks out on climate change, for example. But that was the very beginning in 1891 with Rerum Novarum. The second one then, Quadragesimo Anno, which is Latin for 40th year, which is literally 40 years after Rerum Novarum, it written in 1931 by Pope Pius XI. And what's very important, the first question to ask when you pick up one of these encyclicals is, what is the context? The context in which the popes were writing is very important. Pope Leo's context was the early industrial revolution. Pope Pius XI's context was um, the Great Depression and how mindless greed and speculation led to a, an enormous economic downturn with terrible unemployment and human suffering uh, all across the world. And again, he, he deployed a, a very strong moral diagnosis uh, uh, against kind of um, the excesses of free market capitalism. And he especially developed a principle called subsidiarity, which we will talk about when I go through the principles very shortly. The third uh, encyclical then is 30 years later. We're now, we're now um, after the war. We're now after the war and we're with Pope John XXIII. Now, for those of you who have heard, you know, Pope John XXIII is most famous for, um, for calling the Second Vatican Council, which is an, a, a very important ecumenical council of the Catholic Church, which basically updated a lot of teachings for the modern world and, and opened uh, to the modern world. There was a great document, I'll quote a little bit from it later, called Gaudium et Spes, Hope and Joy, uh, about the church's opening to the modern world. And this council was called by Pope John XXIII, who was elected Pope in his late 70s and was honestly was seen as a kind of a, a transition figure and not expected to do very much. In the end, he, you know, revolutionized how the church views the modern world. And he goes down in, as one of the most consequential popes in history. But in this document, Mater et Magistra, Mother and Teacher, he basically is talking about economics and in particular about not only economic injustices within countries and within sectors in countries between capital and labor, uh, how industrial and agricultural workers are being treated or mistreated, but also between countries. What are our duties to the poor in the developing world? For the first time, 
Pope started getting into that question in a lot of detail. Pope John also introduced a new kind of method of diagnosis that's now called the see, judge, act method. If, if any of you have ever taken theology, which being a good Jesuit university, I'm sure you all have, um, you know, see, judge, act is a basic uh, diagnosis of, of problems to apply moral principles to them. And basically C says, you look at the particular circumstances on the ground. What is the, what is the problem you were diagnosing? Uh, what is the context? Judge then basically says you apply the moral principles to, that, to those circumstances. And then act means what do you do uh, in response to your moral diagnosis? So for example, when, when Pope Francis gets to climate change, you'll see very clearly the See Judge Act methodology in play right there. Two years after Magistra, Pope John XXIII wrote a second encyclical called Pacem in Terrace, where he shifted from economics to peace in the world. Pacem in Terrace is literally peace on earth. And this again, ask yourself the context. This was the height of the Cold War. This was written at a time when the United States and the Soviet Union came within seconds or within hours of nuclear war over the Cuban Missile Crisis, over um, Fidel Castro um, having the Soviets install nuclear missiles in Cuba and the US threatening um, an embargo of Cuba. And as you, anybody who knows from the history of John F. Kennedy, that that came very close to nuclear war. Uh, Pope John XXIII was deeply concerned about this. Um, and he had his um, encyclical translated into Russian. He sent one copy to the White House and he sent one copy in Russian to the Kremlin, to Premier Khrushchev and to John F. Kennedy. And I think that this encyclical helped those two leaders to form a more trust, trusting relationship going forward, the realization that they had to um, trust each other and pull back from the brink of nuclear annihilation. And, and by the way, Professor Jeffrey Sachs has written a book about uh, uh, John F. Kennedy and the quest for peace, which, will, which goes over some of this history. Uh, very nice, very nice sh short book. Um, also in Pachem in Terrace, you see Pope John not only talking about peace, but developing a kind of a Catholic view of human rights. There's a long list of what are you use your human rights. Now, that may seem today we all talk about human rights. Remember, Professor Sachs talked in, about in 1948 how the world agreed on the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was a kind of a cross cultural consensus on what a modern human rights would look like. So fitting into that zeitgeist, Pope John also develops a Catholic notion of human rights. Um, that in a sense was also a little revolutionary because up until that point, human rights were associated with, you know, the French Revolution and the French Revolution was always treated with deep suspicion by the Catholic Church for obvious reasons. But again, in the opening after the Second Vatican Council, there was an, a, a realization that universal human rights were actually uh, deeply coherent with the Catholic tradition. And I'll be talking a little about some of those human rights uh, later on in class. So the fifth document is called Popularum Progressio, written by Pope Paul VI, the successor of John XXIII in 1967, um, on the progress of peoples. And this asks, what does development actually mean? And the answer is, it's a lot deeper and a lot more holistic, and a lot more integral than simply the material dimension of economic growth and GDP. So Pope Paul delved into what development means and also strongly, what are the responsibilities of rich countries to poor countries? It's a very powerful uh, encyclical. It's nice and short. Uh, this is one that I would encourage you to read because it's it's easy to read uh, and it's short unlike some of these go can go hundreds of pages but this one isn't this one is nice and short and it's deeply relevant to a world of sustainable development it's kind of a, 
a proto-encyclical of sustainable development, I would, I would go so far as to argue. This takes us into the long papacy of Pope uh, John, John Paul II. Um, this was the Pope for most of my life. Um, elected, I believe, in 1978, died in 2005. He wrote a lot of encyclicals. He was very, very prolific. But he wrote three social encyclicals, three encyclicals that deal with our social and economic reality. The first one, and uh, my personal favorite of the three, is called Labor Laborum Exercens, which is on labor, written in 1981. And this is basically encyclical devoted to the dignity of labor. Um, a very specific encyclical, but also very powerful. What's the context? Well, the context is um, in Pope John Paul's native Poland, uh, the, the Union Solidarnosc was being threatened with Soviet invasion by, by uh, Premier Brezhnev. And so while the Russian tanks were uh, threatening to cross the border, Pope John Paul II wrote an encyclical on the dignity of labor, which I think was just a brilliant move uh, on, on his part. And again, a lot of the teachings on uh, such as a just wage, the right to unionize, the, the benefits, social benefits, which workers deserve, it's all in that encyclical and a key theme is that the human being is made for work, is through work we find our fulfillment. It's not just about earning a wage, as important as that is, but it's about meaning, purpose, and fulfillment. Very Aristotelian in that sense. So Litsitudo Re Socialis was written in 1987, and this is basically uh, an, an, an updating, I would say, of Popularum Progressio, because it's really devoted to, again, the responsibilities of rich countries to poor countries, and it develops in particular some core themes that we will talk about today, themes of solidarity, global solidarity, and structures of sin, how institutions might lead to defective moral choices. Pope John Paul's possibly his most ambitious social encyclical is Centesimus Annus in 1991. This is written a hundred years after Rerum Novarum. So time passes quickly in the Catholic Church, you can see. We're now 100 years later. We're in 1991. And what's the context there? Well, the context there is the Berlin Wall has fallen. Uh, Soviet communism is dead. And Pope John Paul asked, well, what does that mean? Does that mean we are all free market capitalists? And his answer is clearly no. Um, while, the free, while the free market can be justified, it has to be uh, held within clear moral boundaries. Um, so condemns communism, but only gives a qualified uh, justification um, defense of the free market, has to have a moral boundary. Fast forward to 2009, you're now with well within your lifetimes. Uh, Pope Benedict XVI wrote an encyclical called Caritas and Veritate, Charity and Truth. Um, and this, the context of this was the global financial crisis, which all of you realize was the biggest economic downturn since the Great Depression, which again caused so much unemployment, loss of income, loss of homes, loss of wealth, loss of dignity, loss of respect, um, massive economic and social upheaval that we're still facing today. I would say political upheaval too. And Pope Benedict wrote a very deeply theological and profound thesis on this, which is basically coheres very clearly and overlaps strongly with what we're trying to do in this course. He argues there that every uh, economics must always be rooted in ethics. And without ethics, economics is lost and it goes down the wrong path. And it's all just about power and profit. And ethics must take place within every economic encounter and he talks about the importance of fraternity and reciprocity and solidarity within every economic encounter. That brings us up to date to Pope Francis uh, and Laudato Si, which is my favorite encyclical uh, from 2015. And that's his encyclical on the environment, 
when he talks about issues like climate change, pollution, the destruction of biodiversity, the host of environmental and social problems that we all face. And again, go back to what I said about See, Judge, Act. Pope Francis is applying the See, Judge, Act methodology very clearly here. He sees the problem, uses the, mod uses the scientific consensus to discuss issues like climate change and the destruction of biodiversity, then deploys the moral diagnosis. Uh, how did we get to this situation? Uh, a defective view of human nature, as it were, and, and how we're supposed to treat uh, creation. And then act is basically how we fix this on both, through both personal choices and struck big structural change, all in that encyclical Laudato Si. Again, this is one that I would encourage you all to read because it's very readable. It's a little on the long side, but it's very relevant to everything we're doing in this course. And when we get to sustainable development, we'll definitely be coming back to Laudato Si. And that brings us to the final encyclical on the list, which is Fratelli Tutti, which was issued only a few months ago, last fall, by Pope Francis. And just like Pope John XXIII shifted from economics to world peace, Pope Francis is shifting from economics and the environment to global fraternity. And he talks about the importance of, of friendship and global fraternity between all peoples and between all religions. And the importance of that also includes a strong criticism of uh, unregulated, unfettered free markets as detrimental to human well being. Okay, that in a very quick summary, in a very small nutshell, is the summary of the Catholic social tradition, the encyclical tradition of the popes from 1891 to. 2020. Now, there's a lot of stuff there. A lot of them are deep. A lot of them are long. They're, they're very context specific. But I think that we can derive a set of core principles from these encyclicals. And I've isolated 10. And you can see this in chapter two of my book, which I put in the reading list. Uh, the common good, integral human development, integral ecology, solidarity, subsidiarity, reciprocity and gratuitousness, the universal destination of goods, the preferential option for the poor, Catholic rights and duties, and Catholic notions of justice. So between now and say, I don't know, 11 o'clock, or maybe shortly before then, depending on how quickly I get through this, I'll talk about um, some of these, uh, I'll talk about some of these traditions. Now, given that I'm sharing my screen, uh, I can't see your hands if, any, if you have any questions. So uh, given the nature of the Zoom teaching, maybe we can keep questions to the end, but we will have time to this. I will definitely keep time for discussion uh, at the end of this class, as I mentioned at the beginning. The common good. Well, the common good Pope Francis called a central and unifying principle of social ethics. It's at the very heart of Catholic social teaching, at the very center of it. And we've seen this already. We've seen this from Aristotle when he calls the common good the highest good, greater than any individual good, just like the body is greater than the sum of its individual parts. Uh, everything works together. Remember, Aristotle said we are social animals who only find true fulfillment in, in unity uh, with our fellow human beings um, uh, oriented towards shared purpose and deliberation. And the common good from that tradition is kind of the good arising from the shared social life that transcends the good of the individual and yet can't be broken down into the sum of those goods either. And again, remember I talked about a friendship or a marriage as an example of a common good. and also. In the economic and political sphere, uh, you can also have common goods. So that's Aristotle, but also in the, in the Christian tradition, this is a bit de deepened. The Christian tradition says that we are relational. We're not just autonomous individuals. Like, remember John Locke? John Locke said we're all autonomous individuals. Hobbes said we're all autonomous individuals. Uh, we're free people. Uh, we shouldn't be interfered with. 
But for the Christian, we are actually relational beings. Our very nature is relational. We only find true meaning in relation with everybody else. And that comes from the doctrine of the Trinity, um, where, you know, uh, God himself is relational. And uh, we mirror that inner life of the Trinity. Um, and that means that we don't just seek our own well-being. We seek the well-being of our neighbor. And that gives rise to a true common good. Um, it's not just adding up the individual goods. It's a more holistic sense that we care. Everybody cares about everybody else. And Gaudium et Spes is that, remember I mentioned that that was the, from, 19, from the 1960s. This is the text from the Second Vatican Council, that great text where the church was open to the world. And I'll just read the, read the, the definition. The sum of those conditions of social life which allow social groups and their individual members relatively thorough and ready access to their own fulfillment. That's the political and economic common good, according to the Catholic tradition. Readily, thorough and ready access to their own fulfillment. Now that has an Aristotelian feel to it, doesn't it? Um, it's about the good in and, and through which all can flourish. It includes the material basis of flourishing, obviously, but it's broader than that. So how do you set up institutions so that all people can, have, can reach their own fulfillment and flourishing? That's the common good, uh, according to the Catholic tradition. Now, the opposite of the common good is something called structures of sin. Remember, again, go back to the definition, the sum of those conditions that allow us to reach our fulfillment the sum of those negative factors working against an awareness of the universal common good and the need to further it creates in persons and institution an obstacle which is difficult to overcome. These are institutional impediments to the common good and they're rooted, Pope John Paul II said, in profit and power. Uh, this tells us that uh, if, we want to if we want to support the common good, it's not just about individual change, as important as that is, individual virtue. It's also about social virtue and changing the rules of the socioeconomic system. That's the common good. Okay. Let me go on to principle two, which is very closely related to the common good, which is called integral human development. Integral human development is very simply the fullest development of each person and all people. That's the definition. That's the very succinct definition. Does that sound familiar? Doesn't it sound very much like what Aristotle had in mind by eudaimonia? You know, living life in accordance with what is intrinsically worthwhile uh, to the human being and um, developing the virtues uh, in line with excellence and becoming the best version of ourselves. Well, this says that we want, to, we want to support the good of the whole person, not just the material dimension of the person, not just the economic part of the person, but the whole human being and all people, just like the common good said, we can't exclude anybody. Everybody has to be included in integral human development. And Pope Francis referred to this as kind of finding meaning, a destiny, to live with dignity, to live well, and in that sense, worthily. Um, one way that the Catholic tradition puts it, it says integral human development is, more, is, is, is about being rather than having. It's in a very Aristotelian sense. It's not just about having stuff. Remember when Professor Sachs did um, neoclassical economics and utility functions, it's about getting good C1 and C2. I want more stuff. That makes me happy. That gives me more utility. But this is about being, not just having. It's about who you are as a person, how you develop as a person the through the virtues. Um, so again, we're seeing, this is from 1967, but it actually goes all the way back to Aristotle and Aquinas. 
So in a sense, it's not just, it's about meeting people's needs, yes, but it goes broader than that. It goes beyond that. It's about respecting their agency and their dignity. It is about development, not only on the economic dimension, but across all dimensions, social, emotional, artistic, cultural, psychological, religious. All these different dimensions of the, of the human being should be developed to the full because this is who we are as human beings. So you can see it's very closely um, linked to um, the common good. And through this principle of integral human development, human dignity, the dignity of the human being is intrinsically linked to the common good. You know, we support the common good because we support human dignity and we support human dignity because we support the common good. It's all linked together. And I think integral human development um, is, is kind of builds the bridge between the individual and the common. So that's number two, integral human development. Just checking the time, we're doing well. Number three, integral ecology. Integral ecology comes from Pope Francis in Laudato Si um, in 2015. This is his encyclical on the environment. Um, and integral ecology is the central principle that comes from that encyclical. And, and ecology, remember, for those of you who don't any science, is about is the relationship between living organisms and the environment in which they live. And integral ecology says that these relationships are all interconnected, intertwined, part of a larger whole, encompassing both the human world and the natural world. Everything is connected, Pope Francis says. We are part of nature in constant interaction with it. And how we treat nature affects how we treat ourselves. So for example, if we ignore pollution and climate change, we don't just hurt creation, we hurt human beings because it's the poor of the world who suffer most from pollution, from climate change, from the destruction of biodiversity. It's the world's poorest people who suffer and that's due to integral ecology. So in other words, when we disrupt and disrespect the natural balance, we disrupt the social balance, especially the poor. Now, Pope Francis describes this as an original harmony between the creator, between God, humanity, and creation. Um, and when one of these relationships has been disrupted by arrogance or selfishness or greed or whatever it is, then the other relationships are disrupted too. So if we disrupt our relationship with the earth, we disrupt our relationship with our fellow human beings and even with God. That again is integral ecology. Another dimension of integral ecology is that every creature is a reflection of God's love and has value and significance in its own right. Not just because it's useful to us, but it has value in its own right. Therefore, we have to take care of it and protect it. Um, and that calls us to, in the words of Pope Francis, hear the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. And that I believe is the theology of sustainable development because we're talking about issues of global poverty, global inequality and global uh, lack of sustainability and destruction of the environment. So this is a really a very powerful encyclical, which again, I would encourage everybody to read. Um, and that's, so okay, so that's integral ecology. I think it's quite clear what that means. Let's move on to principle four, which is solidarity. Now, Pope John Paul gives a definition of solidarity, which I think is worth reading in full because I think it's very important and it's a very, it's an excellent definition. So I'll read it then. This then is not a feeling of vague compassion or shallow distress at the misfortunes of so many people, both near and afar. It's not okay. Not a vague, no vague compassion. On the contrary, it is a firm 
and persevering determination to commit oneself to the common good. There is that common good again. That is to say, to the good of all and of each individual. There is integral human development right there. Be and here's the punchline. Because we are all really responsible for all. Solidarity is the idea, is the principle of action that says we are all responsible for all. We are our brothers and sisters keepers. It is a moral response to the interdependence of human life. And I would say in an age of globalization, solidarity is expanded because just as we are more connected to everybody else in the world, so must we extend solidarity to everybody else in the world. Otherwise we get, as Pope Francis says, a globalization of indifference. Pope Francis thinks we live today in the globalization of indifference. And that's because we do not demonstrate solidarity with the people of the world, especially the poor of the world. Um, to use the language of Pope John Paul II, solidarity is what turns those structures of sin into the common good. And solidarity can be seen as a virtue. And remember in Aristotle, a virtue sits between two vices. Um, and the two vices here you could say are individualism or libertarianism on one side, think Locke or Nozick or Hayek or Ayn Rand, somebody like that, and collectivism on the other, think Marx, think Lenin, think Soviet communism. So solidarity sits between the two and hence is a, a virtue. Um, and Pope Francis says, calls for something called a new and universal solidarity to tackle the problems like poverty, marginalization, vulnerability, and environmental devastation. Uh, that solidarity, by the way, goes across generations because when we talk about the environment, one thing we're doing is protecting the well being of future generations, those who are not yet born, and maybe even across species, because remember, each creature has value. Uh, and so, we need to respect all of creation. And that really says we need to demonstrate solidarity with all of creation. We are responsible not just for our fellow human beings, but for all of creation. Um, okay, that's solidarity. Let's move on to principle five, subsidiarity. Now this is complicated. Subsidiarity is probably the most complicated of the principles of Catholic social teaching. And it's probably the most misunderstood a lot of people read, see subsidiarity and say small government, uh, local level stuff, get rid of big government. And that's way, way too simplistic. Solidarity is basically the principle by which decisions are taken at the lowest level possible and the highest level necessary. It basically insists that higher order associations think, say, the, gov the state should assist lower level associations or communities, but not usurp their rightful autonomy, help them achieve their fulfillment. So in other words, to respect a person's agency and dignity, you often want to do, you, you often want to do something at, a low, at the lowest level, at the human level. It's a human level principle. But, some, but the higher level associations like the state are not supposed to be hands off in the libertarian sense. They're supposed to help. They're supposed to make, they're supposed to step in and, and help you do it. And there are plenty of examples we can discuss later if you like about what does that mean in practice. Um, this is most associated by the way with Pope Pius XI in Quadragesimo Anno who argued that why we need solidarity is because when social life decays, all that's left is the individual and the state. That's all that's left is the individual and the state. Whereas we want, we want these lower level associations, this associational life, things like families and churches and unions and voluntary associations and small businesses all these things whereby people can 
find their fulfillment that's that's bigger than the individual but smaller than the state um that in a sense is what subsidiarity is all about making sure that this association of life can flourish because this is how people can flourish and become happy um and when you're left with only the state and individuals you run into problems and if you one diagnosis of the past 40 years including in the us is that a lot of these subsidiary associations have withered away and people are left on their own uh, with less of a communal life and less of a feeling of belonging to the broader community and all that's left is the individual and the state so back in the 1930s pope pius saw this where this would clearly lead pope francis also talks about subsidiarity and he argues that it, it grants and to quote him grants freedom to develop the capabilities present at every level of society while also demanding a greater sense of responsibility for the common good from those who wield power so this tells you straight away that subsidiarity is not about a hands-off state in fact it's quite the opposite it's about you know not just from bottom to top but also from from top to bottom it's all it's about respecting the dignity and agency of all people including the marginalized and excluded subsidiarity is often twinned together with solidarity and um, so for example paul benedict says that if you have so solidarity without subsidiarity you can often have a overbearing welfare state which ignores the dignity of the human being but if you have subsidiarity without solidarity you lead too much towards individualism so they're they're twin principles you often see to you often see solidarity and subsidiarity twinned together principle six is reciprocity and gratuitousness reciprocity is a human level principle uh, if solidarity is about basically being responsible for every person in the world, the whole of our, all of our human brothers and sisters. Reciprocity is really about caring about the well-being of the, the human person on the, on the other side of the economic encounter, because that person is a brother or sister. It's about reciprocity is you do something to give a benefit to the other, not to get something back, but because you do it for its own sake and what tends to happen then in reciprocity is if I extend the benefit to you, that builds trust between us. It embeds sociability and fraternity, which means I am like you are likely to give me a benefit later on. And, you know, and that's how it works. Notice how different this is from the, the world of Adam Smith, which is about you, you 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 deal with the person on the other side of the economic encounter only through self-interest it's you know i do it to make money or to sell my goods because um it's not to, it's, it's self-interest but here it's not self-interest it's about you're actually caring about the well-being of the person on the other side of the economic encounter and by the way this happens all the time in real life um reciprocity like uh, just one example if you're you're working for a boss and the boss says to you well you know uh, we're really at a crunch time i need you to work this weekend and uh, you don't want to work on the weekend you had plans with friends uh, but but your boss is a good guy or a good woman and you like your boss and uh, so you work on the weekend what then happens is you've built a, you've built a certain trust. You have given a benefit to your boss. You know you didn't have to. Uh, you could have said no. I've already have plans, but you did it anyway because you you like your boss. And in turn, then, let's say a couple of months down the line, you need to take a few days off to take care of some family business, whatever it is. And you ask your boss, "I need to take this time off." Your boss will say. Yes, take the time off because he or she remembers when you did him or her a benefit a few months earlier. So is more likely to say yes. Whereas if you had basically said back then, sorry, I'm not working on the weekend. I've got friends, I've got plans with friends. 
And then you turn around and ask for leave a couple of months later. The boss is like, why should I give you leave? You didn't step up for me when I was there. So this is kind of how reciprocity works. It works all the time in everyday life. And it builds trust. It builds social cohesion and it supports the common good. It's not wishy-washy at all. Um, Pope Francis, and it's related to the idea of gratuitousness, which Pope Francis decide, that defines as to do things simply because they are good in themselves without concern for personal gain or reconsents. You give somebody a benefit because it's good in itself. The encyclical where this is drawn out most is Caritas and Veritate by Pope Benedict the 16th from 2009. And I'll give you a couple of quotes from him. So authentically human relationships of friendship, solidarity and reciprocity can also be conducted within economic activity, not only outside it or after it. In commercial relationships, the principle of gratuitousness and the logic of gift as an expression of fraternity can and must find their place within normal economic activity. In other words, it's not just the role of private charity or the government. It's not about outside economic activity or after it. It's inside every market uh, exchange. You must demonstrate re reciprocity and gratuitousness. And for that reason, the economic sphere is not ethically neutral, nor inhuman or opposed to society. It is part and parcel of human activity. And precisely because it is human, it must be structured and government in an ethical manner. Every economic decision has a moral consequence. Again, that goes against some of the social, tradition, social justice traditions that Professor Sachs talked to you about on Tuesday, especially the libertarian traditions, which says that the government should stand outside and economics is about maximizing your own gain. It's not about uh, doing a benefit for somebody else. Number seven is the universal destination of goods. Professor Sachs mentioned this. This goes all the way back to the church, go all the way back to the, in the, the, the Hebrew and Christian scriptures, goes back to Aquinas. It says that the goods of the earth are destined for all without exception, without exclusion. Pope John Paul said that it's a first, called it a first principle of the ethical and social order. He said it's like private property comes with a social mortgage. So private property is justified, but it comes with a social mortgage. So in other words, if you have private property, you must make sure the needs of all are met. So that's why Pope Francis calls it a secondary natural right, secondary natural right, and uh, not a primary natural right, secondary, because you must make sure that the needs of all are met. And I want and uh, read that quote from Pope Francis there, which I think is very, very strong. Working for a just distribution of the fruits of the earth and human labor is not mere philanthropy, it is a moral obligation for Christians the responsibility is even greater. It is a commandment. It is about giving to the poor and to peoples what is theirs by right. The universal destination of goods is not a figure of speech found in the church's social teachings. It is a reality prior to private property. Now, when I talked about Thomas Aquinas last week, I skipped over this part um, because... Um, because I, was, I knew I was going to get to it this week. Whoops. I guess I didn't put it in. Sorry, I thought I'd put this slide in there. I didn't put it in. But Thomas Aquinas basically said that private property is legitimate, but not unconditional. He distinguished between private ownership and common use. Um, so... Aquinas basically said private property is justified. And he gave a bunch of kind of, I would say, efficiency arguments for private property. If you, if you own something, you're more likely to take care of it uh, well. So like, take, take example, if you have your own car, or let's say you live in a, 
a house with a bunch of your friends and four of you own the car together, well, bad things can happen to that car because everybody is basically saying, well, it's somebody else's responsibility to change the oil or to fix it or whatever it is with the car. Whereas, so this is Aquinas' argument as to why private property is justified. It's kind of an efficiency argument. But common use means the needs of all must be met. So basically, he said, in case, his, and, and the quote here is, and this, by the way, will, you can see this in the slides I had last week on Aquinas. In case of need, all things are common. Just make sure I didn't put that in there. No. Nope. In case of need, all things are common. So there would be no sin in taking another's property for need has make it common. This is sometimes called the Jean Valjean principle. Who's Jean Valjean? Put your hand up if you know who Jean Valjean is. Okay, Jean Valjean from Les Miserables. Um, he, got sent to put in, he got sent to prison for like 20 years or something like that for stealing a loaf of bread. Um, Thomas Aquinas would argue that if you're starving, there's nothing wrong with stealing that loaf of bread. Um, because need has made it common. A uh, very important principle. Some people today might consider, would consider Thomas Aquinas a bit of a communist for saying that, but he wasn't. He's a Christian. And uh, need has made it common. And, and, and I would argue today that, uh, as a very relevant example today with vaccines, with COVID vaccines, uh, I would say that need has made COVID vaccines common. Uh, we should make sure that everybody in the world in all countries, including the poorest countries, have access to vaccines, whether or not they can afford them, because it's a matter of life and death, getting these vaccines out. And there's a clear example as to why it can't be just about private property. Private property has a social mortgage, need makes things common. That's, so that's the universal destination of goods. And that's a central, central, central um, uh, principle of how Catholic social teaching views economic life, how we judge whether economic life is uh, good or bad, or whether it's working or not working, whether we meet the universal destination of goods. Related to that is the preferential option for the poor. Um, the preferential option for the poor comes because God, remember we saw with Jesus that God identifies with the poor and how we are judged will depend on how we treat the poor. Therefore, economic and social policy should always prioritize the poor. It's about the liberation of the poor, the powerless, the ignored, the discarded, the insignificant, the excluded, those at the margins. Pope Francis refers to this as the throwaway culture. John Paul refers to this as a special form of primacy in the exercise of Christian charity to which the whole tradition of the church bears witness, the preferential option for the poor. And Pope Francis links it very clearly to both solidarity and the common good. He said, solidarity must be lived as the decision to restore to the poor what belongs to them. So it's a, it's a subcase, a subcategory of the universal destination of goods, the preferential option of the poor. Number nine is rights and duties. Remember I talked about Pacem in Terrace by Pope John XXIII talked about human rights. So a right is a moral claim that others have an obligation to accept. Uh, we can think of political rights and economic rights. So political rights are things like freedom of expression, freedom of the press, uh, the right to vote, uh, all that kind of thing. And economic rights will be include the right to food, the right to clothing, the right to shelter, the right to health care. Um, if you think about that in the United States, political rights are very much, much more important than economic rights. Um, in fact, a lot of people would deny that economic rights even exist. Um, but in the Catholic tradition, I would argue that the Catholic tradition includes economic rights. In fact, I would say that economic rights are absolutely central to the Catholic tradition. Uh, relatedly, rights are always linked to the common good. They're not about 
individual liberty or libertarianism or the right to do what you want. They're linked to the common good. And they're also, point three, attached to duties. So every right is attached to a corresponding duty. If you have a right to something, then you have a duty to do something else or somebody else has a duty to provide that right for you. So this is, the, the, the John the 23rd gives a very long list of rights. And this is the first one. Man has the right to live. The right to life is central. He has the right to bodily integrity and to the means necessary for the proper development of life, including food, clothing, shelter, medical care, rest, necessary social services. In consequence, he has the right to be looked after in the event of ill health, disability stemming from work, widowhood, old age, enforced unemployment, and whenever through no fault of his own, he is deprived of the means of livelihood. In the Catholic tradition, these are the preeminent rights. They're central. Okay. Um, Pope Francis talks about the rights to, to the three L's of land, labor, lodging. Uh, in Spanish, there are three T's, but my Spanish is not good enough to remember what those three T's are. Those of you who speak Spanish will know what those three T's are. Land, labor, lodging is how we say it in English. And he said that just economy must create the conditions for everyone to be able to enjoy a childhood without want, to develop their talents when young, to work with full rights during their active years, and to enjoy a dignified retirement when they grow older. He also talks about the rights of the environment. And this is for two reasons. He says, this is because we are intimately connected to nature through integral ecology. So every time we interfere with nature, we interfere with our human well-being. We interfere with the social life. And also because all creation has intrinsic value in its own right. That's the second reason. So because of those two reasons, Pope Francis, and this is in his speech to the United Nations in 2015, said that the environment actually has rights. And a very powerful quote from Laudato Si, which I put in there for you, uh, because of us, thousands of species will no longer give glory to God by their very existence, nor convey their message to us. We have no such right. It's a very, very powerful quote. That brings us to 10, Catholic notions of justice. Now remember, justice is a virtue. For Aquinas, it's a cardinal virtue. And it's one of the most important virtues in economic life. Justice is basically the virtue where we give each other what is their due, what is owed to them. Hence, it's linked to the common good. Now, there are three types of justice in the Catholic tradition, and these go back to Aristotle and Aquinas. Commutative justice is the justice between two individuals related to the mutual obligations. So think of, the con think of contracts and agreements. So everybody, including libertarians, would agree that commutative justice is important. You keep promises, you respect contracts. Justice between individuals. Distributive justice is what the community owes the individual. Libertarians do not believe distributive justice exists. Society doesn't owe you anything, they would say. The Catholic tradition says, actually, it does. If you have rights to things like food and clothing and lodging and health care and education, then society has a duty to make sure these goods are provided to you through distributive justice. But there's also another direction called contributive justice, and that's what the individual owes society. Think of voting, participating in civic life, paying your taxes, making sure that the environment is left in good shape for future generations. That's all part of contributive justice. It's what you as an individual owe society. So this can all be linked. And uh, this, this is a chart, by the way, that comes from my friend, from Father Dan Grudy, who's a theologian at Notre Dame. So you see here, the individual and the common good the individual goes to the common good 
through contributive justice and the common good or society comes to the individual through distributive justice. Commutative justice then is between two individuals and we see rights that go that rights come from the common good to the individual and duties are from the individual to the common good. So it's all tied together. Final point I want to make is how do these principles stack up to the principles of neoclassical economics? Understanding of the person, autonomous individuals, remember Locke, Hobbes, Nozick, Rand, um, Hayek, all of the libertarian tradition would say we are all autonomous individuals. Do you remember the enlightenment paradigm I said? Catholic social teaching, we are beings in relation. Our very identity is defined by our relational nature. What motivates the person? Neoclassical economics following Adam Smith says self-interest. Catholic social teaching says solidarity, reciprocity, and gratuitousness. What's the good of the person? Remember when we did neoclassical economics, I said it's the satisfaction of your subjective material preferences. It's maximizing your utility. Catholic social teaching says it's integral human development. It's the fullest development of the whole person and all people across all dimensions. The good of society for neoclassical economics is just adding up utilities, the aggregation of your preferences. Or GDP, GDP will be an example of that. But for Catholic social teaching, it's the common good, which we've talked about in great detail. How does market function? Neoclassical economics says competition only. Catholic social teaching says, yes, competition is fine, but also solidarity and reciprocity and gratuitousness. They also must feature in how the market functions. What's the standard of judgment? Well, remember we talked about Pareto efficiency, economic growth. That's how you judge whether the economy is healthy. But for Catholic social teaching, you judge how the economy is healthy by saying, are you meeting the universal destination of goods? Are you meeting the preferential option for the poor? What about the understanding of rights? Well, neoclassical economics says you have to have property rights. Uh, remember, John, John Locke also said the very importance of property rights. Catholic social teaching says property rights are not absolute because of the universal destination of goods. And you also have economic rights. What about norms of justice? Neoclassical economics, it's only commutative. The justice between two individuals, contracts, promises. Catholic social teaching, it's all three. It's commutative it's distributive, it's contributive. What's the role of government? Well, it's a neutral referee. You set back, you stand back and let the market work and maybe you step in to correct market failures. For Catholic social teaching, it's both solidarity and subsidiarity. You make sure you lend a helping hand to make sure all these needs are met. And the treatment of nature, neoclassical economics has no real way to discuss the treatment of nature except in an ex excuse me in an extractive sense because you want to uh, maximize economic growth and of course for catholic social teaching it's about respect for nature it's about integral ecology now i've gone through a lot of stuff this morning i'm going to stop there and we're going to have a little discussion right now um all of this by the way is available uh, in the readings, it's, it's available in my in my Catonomics book. Um, so yeah, I would encourage you to read some of the encyclicals. Start with Laudato Si, because I think it's probably the most important. We'll come back to that in a later course to get, when we talk about sustainable development. Um, but yeah, so let's talk about the assignment I've given you. Um, so we have asked you to basically write a short essay. No, 2,000 words. It doesn't have to be long. Um, shorter is good, actually. Um, and we wanted to make this fun for you because this is a very 
important and contemporary relevant topic for you right now. Um, universal basic income. That is an income that goes to everybody in society, whether you're, this, well, no matter what your work status is or how wealthy you are, everybody gets a fixed amount of money every year. Um, this was promoted during the Democratic primaries last year by Andrew Yang. Um, it's a very lively discussion. Uh, when Joe Biden is talking about sending out two, $2,000 checks, that's a kind of a form of universal basic income. But it's not really because there's an income cutoff, but it's a form of it, I would say. But that's what the universal basic income is. I think you all know that. So this is a very live discussion. People are talking about this every day. Economists are debating it and politicians are debating it. And we want you to debate it. Take your different traditions that we discussed, take four of them, and basically argue, what would this tradition say about the universal basic income? Would it be for it? Would it be against it or why? And then using, then basically give your own argument. Which, do you, which argument do you think is most convincing and why? In 2000 words. Now, so think about some of these traditions. Obviously, I've just talked about the Catholic social tradition in great detail, so that would be an obvious one to go. So it won't, it's, it's clear from principles of solidarity and the universal destination of good, the kind of arguments you could make from the Catholic tradition. Um, there's also the, remember we talked about um, the tradition of Aristotle and Aquinas. Um, Remember, though, it's a, it's, there, are, there are nuances and subtleties there. Because remember, for Aristotle, you could argue that you need to, for eudaimonia, for human flourishing, you need to make sure that people's material needs are met so you could have a universal basic income. But on the other hand, eudaimonia is based on uh, a much fuller development of the human than simply money. So you might argue that it's not compatible with Aristotle. I'm just, I'm just shooting from the hip here, just to give you some ar ar arguments that could possibly be made. Um, if you want to talk about utilitarianism, remember the argument I made from Peter Singer about the girl drowning in the lake and, and what that means in terms of our global obligation to the poorest in the world in terms of maximizing the greatest happiness of the greatest number. If you want to talk about the various individualistic traditions, uh, John Locke, which basically said the government has no right to take your property. Ayn Rand, who basically argued that selfishness is good uh, and we have makers and takers and the makers should not be giving to the takers. Um, Nozick also, uh, Hayek, who thought that if you had a very large welfare state, you could um, end up with, um, an all-powerful government which could lead to tyranny uh, and suppress individual freedom. And he wrote, we have a, we've put an abridged version of The Road to Serfdom in your reading packet, if you want to read that. Um, there's also John Rawls, which we only touched on in very small detail. I have put a reading of John a reading from Michael Sandel's book called Justice, which is a brilliant book, by the way. Some of you might have seen it or read it. A very good book on the different um, moral philosophical traditions that we are touching on here. He's not reading, he's not, Sandel's not writing about economics uh, like we are, more general, but it's relevant. And I think his, John Rawls is a very difficult person to read uh, himself. Uh, he's not the clearest writer, so I wouldn't recommend reading his theory of justice itself. But Sandel's chapter on John Rawls does a very good job in explaining the basics. And by the way, just, uh, just to, to flag it, that we're going to be coming back to John Rawls when we talk about the theory of, um, of, gov of the role of government in two weeks' time. So um, this is just a precursor. We'll be coming back to John Rawls. So, but if you, want, if you want to write about Rawls for your essay, uh, uh, the source is there. If you don't, that's fine. Don't have to. And we'll come back to him in uh, uh, a couple of, uh, of weeks. So there's plenty of material plenty of arguments. I would think about this. Think about your own position. 
think and think about how your position has been informed by the social justice traditions in class and write your essay again it doesn't have to be long we don't actually we don't want it to be too long uh, we prefer it to be succinct and and, and be in your own voice and um, I said um, uh, next Friday the 26th uh, can be due let me be uh, let me be lenient about that let's say it's due on Monday, uh, the, the following Monday. So what's that, the 29th? So let's say noon on Monday, uh, the 29th. Is that, is that a Monday? Let me check my calendar. March 1st. Ah, there is no 29th of February. Thank you very much. Monday, March 1st. So that's a nice number. So Monday, so let's say it's due, due on noon on Monday, March 1st. So I'll give you, so you have two weekends. I'll, I'll, I'll be lenient. It's, the, the weather's bad. We're still in, we're still in lockdown. We're still doing this through Zoom. So let's 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 show some self care and kindness and give yourself an extra weekend to write the essay. Um, yeah. Okay. We have three minutes left. I'm willing, to, but you know, I'm willing to stay on uh, after the zoo after the class ends. You can all be free free to go though. The class is over. But uh, if you have any questions on what we talked about today or about the assignment, uh, now's your chance. I'll shut up. No. Oops. Yes. Jim, right? Hey, Jim. I, I didn't find the raise of hand, but as quickly as I'd like to. I, um, I liked your example about the boss and the subordinates under reciprocity, if I remember the details correctly. Mm -hmm. um, I think reciprocity also operates in a, in a more indirect universal way. I think that when we um, operate generously uh, with our boss or anybody else, um, that creates part of an environment where the boss operates more generously with somebody else and somebody else operates more generously with somebody else or in reciprocity. And eventually it comes back to me, but not necessarily directly from the boss and that we create an environment that we're all kind of behaving that way. Does that make any sense? That makes a hunt, that makes perfect sense, Jim. Yeah, I think that's exactly what happens when reciprocity builds trust and social cohesion and strengthens the social capital of the society more generally. Yes, 100% true. And I think that's what Pope Benedict was getting at when he talked about why reciprocity is so important. Uh, for our not just not just morally but for our economic interactions so th so thanks for that jim anybody else okay it's 11 15 so the class yep. is the class is over um i will i am going to stop the recording remember remember on your blackboard you get these you can get these recordings uh there we also have the question and answer session and um, Nobody's asked any questions. There's no discussion on the question and answer session yet. I check every little while to see if there are any Q&A and nobody's answered any questions yet. So this is your chance to have a discussion with your fellow classmates. Do you like universal basic income? Is Andrew Yang right? Should he be mayor of New York? Yes, no. Plenty of things to discuss. Um, so go ahead and do it and I'll check in on that. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's the assignment. That's the class. Next week, uh, we will be talking about... Um, I believe I believe we're coming. We're talking about uh, making choices for trust and social, making political choices for trust and social cohesion next week. So it'll be very interesting, and we have a little bit of fun doing it. Okay, have a good day, everyone. Stay away from the terrible weather. Stay safe, and um, I'm going to stop the recording. But I'm going to stay on the Zoom if anybody wants to ask uh, uh, questions uh, privately uh, afterwards. Uh, otherwise, email me or use the, use the uh, ask questions feature in Blackboard. All right. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you, Professor. Have a Thank good weekend. You, Have Bye. a good Thank Thank you, nice weekend, Professor. Have a nice weekend, Professor. Thank you. Ooh.